What's going on YouTube? My name is Matt and as you can see from the title of the video, I am a former Jehovah's Witness elder. I gave most of my life to the Jehovah's Witness organization. I gave so much time, effort, and energy to what I thought was God's earthly organization. And I truly felt that I was giving God the praise and the glory and the honor and doing the right thing in teaching people about the good news of God's kingdom. But today I'm no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses and I have nothing to do with that organization. So you might be wondering why? Why would someone who gave so much time and effort and even progressed to the point of becoming an elder, why would you no longer want to be part of that organization? Well, strap on your seatbelts because I got an interesting story for you. Um, I'm going to try and truncate it and make it as quick as possible uh, as to not bore you too much, but I'm going to tell my story and I'm going to get to my doubts and why I'm no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses anymore. But before I do that, let me just give you a little background on myself and hopefully that'll help you understand why I'm here today. So I was born and raised in Queens, New York City. I was born to two non-Jehovah's Witness parents. My mother was not religious until the very end of her life. And my father uh, is like, uh, I guess you could call him a cultural Catholic. He's Catholic because that was the religion he was born in. He doesn't really attend mass or go to confession or anything, but you know, he follows basic traditions, doesn't smoke for Lent, things like that. So that's what he does. So when I was about 18 months old, my parents decided to separate. And so my mother and I went to go live with her parents, not too far away, still in Queens. And I was raised by my mother, my grandfather, and my grandmother. Now my mother and my grandfather were not religious, but my grandmother was. My grandmother was raised in the South, in rural North Carolina as a Baptist. But once she came to New York City and met my grandfather, she came into contact uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses by chance. And she started studying the Bible over time she studied for close to two decades, really. She started in the 1950s, and uh, she studied and studied, but by the late 60s, she really took a hold of her study, and she ended up getting baptized in 1970 at Yankee Stadium. Now, my grandmother and my grandfather altogether had nine kids, but none of them initially decided to be Jehovah's Witnesses. They just didn't think that was the lifestyle for them as they reached adulthood. But... My two aunts later in the 1980s decided to become Jehovah's Witnesses. One of my aunts got baptized and jumped right into regular pioneering. And for those who are not familiar with that term, a regular pioneer is someone who dedicates a massive amount of hours every month to preaching the Bible. Back in those days, it was 90 hours a month. My other aunt uh, was married to a non-Jehovah's Witness, but she still decided to dedicate her life to Jehovah and the organization and she got baptized and she had a daughter at the time and later had a son and those two kids uh, my cousins were later on they became huge motivating factors and why I became one of Jehovah's Witnesses and they became my main mentors but those are my only uh, aunts or uncles that decided to take the truth of Jehovah's Witnesses my, not my mother or any of my uncles decided to become Jehovah's Witnesses. But me, growing up in a house with my grandmother, who was a Jehovah's Witness, I clearly heard a lot about Jehovah's Witnesses, and I was always exposed to their books and their publications. On top of that, to lay my foundation to later become one of Jehovah's Witnesses, I ended up going to a school that was geared towards Jehovah's Witness children. Now, what happened was there was a local Jehovah's Witness brother who bought a school and he decided to market it primarily to the Jehovah's Witness community. And of course, there were other kids who were not Jehovah's Witnesses that attended because that's how I ended up there. Uh, it was mostly by word of mouth. They had, you know, Jehovah's Witness family or, or relatives, uh, friends. And that's how the non-Witness children like myself ended up at the school. But I'd say the school at the time when I attended was about 80% Jehovah's Witness children, 20% uh, non-Jehovah's Witnesses. And there was a lot of emphasis on Jehovah's Witness theology. Now, it was a very good school, 
academically. My mother was a teacher. She wouldn't have sent me to a bad school. It was a very, very good academic school. I learned a lot there, but I also learned a lot of Jehovah's Witness theology. Uh, for the first and second graders, every day there was an older pioneer sister that would come in and do a communal Bible study with the class from my book of Bible stories. And for the Jehovah's Witness children, you know, this Bible study and learning the Jehovah's Witness theology was not difficult for them. But for me, it was really very new because I never went to any place of worship regularly. My mother wasn't religious, and I would visit the Kingdom Hall time to time with my grandmother, but I was a little kid. I mostly just viewed it as boring, and I just wanted to hang out with the other young boys that were at the hall, you know, after the meeting and talk about sports or video games, cartoons, comics, whatever. So we did get a nice, rigorous uh, Bible education, the Bible as taught by Jehovah's Witnesses, and I ended up um, learning basic things about the Bible. To give you an example of like the type of things we did at school, I remember one day I had this teacher in first grade, really tough teacher, by the way, and she wanted kids to come up and stand in front of the class and name the 66 books of the Bible in order. Now, for the Jehovah's Witness children, for most of them, I guess because they did family study at home or because they were used to being at the meeting, this was easy for them. For me, this was difficult. I knew maybe the first three books, and then I drew a blank. Thankfully, there was one girl in the class who took pity on me, and she started mouthing the names of the books of the Bible to me, and I was able to get through it. But the rest of the kids in the class were pointing and laughing at me. I mean, hey. Little kids point and laugh at silly things. I'm not mad at them for it. I was at the time, though. So it, it was a very rigorous uh, Jehovah's Witness education. And even though I wasn't a witness, I learned a lot about the religion from that school. But even um, being exposed to the witnesses in that way, I didn't you know, take to the religion at that time. It wasn't until I was 12 years old when... I really decided to learn about religion. My grandmother had really been on my back because my two witness cousins were in the congregation with her. And I had other cousins, another really close cousin that went to church with his mother and father and other cousins that lived uh, down south that always went to church with their families. And my grandmother would say, you know, all of your cousins go to a place of worship, but you don't. You need to get yourself together, young man. So really just to, you know, ease grandma's fears and to calm her down and say, all right, fine, I'll come to the Kingdom Hall. And I started coming regularly on the weekends. But interestingly, I started liking what I heard. It sounded very interesting, almost intellectual to me. Because as, you know, young man, 12 years old, when you have questions about religion and they're always answered from the Bible, they're answered from some kind of publication, it's impressive. It's like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. And the biggest thing for me was I had a fear of death, huge fear of death. You know, I had this huge existential crisis because I'm like, I don't want to die. I don't want to not exist, not have consciousness anymore. So when I started uh, to go to the Kingdom Hall and I learned about the prospect of eternal life, it was amazing to me. I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I can live forever, and because the last days are so close, the end is right around the corner, I might never have to die? Man, sign me up! And, you know, I jumped right in. I started progressing because a brother in the congregation decided to study with me and my other male cousin, um, and, you know, we just jumped right in. We progressed so quickly. I mean, I became an unbaptized publisher when I was 13. Uh, that next year, the week, bef week after I turned 14, I got baptized at Nassau Coliseum. And it was, I mean, it was amazing to me. I was like, wow, I'm really doing the right thing. I'm following what God wants, and God is going to bless me with eternal life. This is amazing. So interesting story. About my baptism two two interesting things um, I ended up getting baptized on a Friday which is a little uncommon because um, in America most times baptisms happen on Saturdays because at conventions they're Friday Saturday Sunday baptism happens on the Saturday 
I got baptized on a Friday because our convention got moved to Thursday, Friday, Sunday, because it was a huge Beyonce concert happening that Saturday. I don't remember if it was Beyonce herself or Beyonce and Destiny's Child. Not really important, but <laughs> the convention venue was like, yeah, you Jehovah Witnesses, get out of here, make way for Beyonce. So I ended up getting baptized on a Friday. And that day, Garrett Loesch of the governing body was at the convention. And I got to meet him. He shook my hand. He asked me how old I was. And he told me, you know, serving Jehovah is the best way of life. Uh, so at the time, I, I found that amazing. I was like, wow, I got to meet a governing body member, shook his hand. I mean, that man's going to be in heaven. This is amazing. You know, so I, I thought that was like so great. And I was like, wow, I'm really joining the the true religion officially and I, I have a chance at eternal life this is amazing you know so like I said I was a true blue true blue believer I, I jumped right in I got baptized in July that next month I was auxiliary pioneering went out in service every single day that month you know and I was doing everything in the congregation handling microphones doing literature taking out meetings for field service Anything that the brothers allowed me to do, I would do. And I was in one of those congregations that was very pro-young people. If you were a young person and you wanted to work, they would give you work. And I was doing everything possible. And we had a good group of young men in the congregation that liked to work hard. And we did everything we could. So as a teenager... I was doing watchtower readings. I was helping with the accounts. I was helping with literature. It, I mean, if it was possible to be done, I would do it. I, you know, attendant at conventions, uh, RBC projects, I would gladly offer myself for that. I did everything because I wanted to give my time to the true God. You know, I always thought about that scripture in Ecclesiastes, you know. Do not forget your creator in your youth. So, I didn't want to forget Jehovah. I gave Jehovah my all. So, when I reached 18, um, I ended up getting a full-time job working for the city. But, that kind of derailed my dream of going to Bethel and also the fact that there was a sister in the congregation I happened to really like and, you know, we started dating. So, that also derailed my dream of Bethel because she wasn't interested in going to Bethel. But um, I started serving as a ministerial servant at 18. Um, I gave my first public talk at 19. Got married when I was 20 to my wife, uh, who was in the congregation with me. And she was a regular pioneer at the time. And I had started uh, regular pioneering also at 20. And, you know, I was giving even more to Jehovah as a married man. I started uh, going out giving public talks at 21 and I mean, I gave so many talks. I, I mean, full disclosure, I'm 27, about to be 28 now. I gave at least 120 public talks because there were times where I was giving three and four talks a month because I was willing to give talks and I was uh, you know, always called on as a substitute speaker if a brother got sick or if someone didn't show up hey call Matt they would call me up I would come give talks and speaking was something that most people considered my gift you know giving talks was something that I enjoyed I loved preparing talks and I, I really tried to polish my talks and make them great not just for the witnesses who are at the meeting but also for the interested worldly people non-witnesses who attended meetings. So I was, again, re working really hard in the congregation, doing everything I could, because it was a, a dream of mine to serve as an elder. I really wanted to serve as an elder. I really wanted to give more of myself to the organization. I eventually wanted to serve as a circuit overseer because I felt, hey, why not give of myself and become a traveling overseer who helps people the way traveling overseers have helped me in the past. That was the way I looked at it. And I had really great interactions with circuit overseers over my time in the organization. One circuit overseer I even considered a, a close friend. And this man 
you know, 70 years old, but I consider him a close friend. Me and him would talk on the phone for hours because we were really close like that, really good friends. So anyway, um, when I was about 24, yeah, I was 24 when I got appointed as an elder, and that was really exciting for me. Um, funny enough, I got appointed as an elder when Gary Bro, helper to the governing body, was visiting our congregation. Uh, because from time to time, circuit overseers get a shepherding visit from uh, a branch committee member or a helper to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. And it just happened to be that Gary Bro was the person who was uh, visiting that week. And I worked in service with him. I talked to him for a long time. He got to know me. He asked me a lot of probing questions. I didn't realize it at the time, but he was asking me questions to see how I would uh, be able to serve as an elder. And so uh, that fateful Saturday morning of the visit, they called me in the office. Uh, my cousin, who was the secretary at the time, he, he was already appointed as an elder, the circuit overseer and Gary Bro. And they asked me the two questions, you know, is there any reason why you can't serve as an elder? I'm like, no, not at all. And that to me was relieving because I didn't know what they called me in the office for. I'm like, man, am I in trouble? I ain't doing nothing wrong. And uh, then the second question, and I don't remember if they asked me this when I got appointed as a ministerial servant, um, but they asked, you know, have you ever uh, uh, committed child sexual abuse? I'm like, whoa, absolutely not. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And that was a surprise to me because I didn't know that, you know, child sexual abuse was a question that was asked. Now, I knew a little bit at the time that it was a problem, and I'll get into that later, but I didn't realize that was a question that was asked uh, before people became elders. So I said, absolutely not, you know, and so I said, all right, well, you're going to serve as an elder. And so I asked Gary Bro, like, hey, um, why do you ask that question about uh, child sexual abuse? Because you know, I'm curious. So, you know, I had no idea that that was a thing to be asked. And he's like, well, you know, it's uh, really just a legal protection for the organization. You know, some brothers have done some terrible things in the past. We don't want the society to take blame for it. And at the time, I didn't really think much of that response. But now looking back on it, I'm like, wow, that was a really legalistic response. And you should have responded that we don't want people taking advantage of children. But no, instead, you were worried about the legalities of the organization. Good job, Gary. So anyway, I got appointed as an elder and, you know, I started doing even more. You know, I, mean, I used to conduct the watchtower from time to time, public talks I was organi organizing. Um, my congregation got merged in the, the big master plan from the branch, and I ended up going to another congregation, uh, quickly was appointed the service overseer, and I was handling all kinds of assignments, you know. Um, yeah, I, I again, I was pioneering the metropolitan witnessing, uh, public witnessing with the congregation, serving as an elder. I was doing everything my wife with me you know pioneering i pioneered all together for uh, seven years she pioneered for 10 years we were giving our all uh, then in uh, 2017 uh, my wife and i had a daughter uh, we welcomed her into the world and that was really exciting and that kind of slowed us down in the ministry a little bit but i was still working hard as a husband doing family study and you know, I'm working in a congregation, I'm giving talks, I'm still trying my best as an elder, right? Even though it was a little slowed down because, uh, you know, I was getting used to becoming a parent, still giving my all, still true blue believer, even though I had some doubts at the time. So that was basically my, my background, my spiritual lineup, you know? So let me get into the doubts. So I'm going to rewind a few years um, and go back to 2015. And this was my first real big doubt. Now, I had had minor doubts, as everyone does over time, if you don't understand things. But I always reflected on that scripture in uh, John chapter 6. You know, where are we to go? You have the sayings of everlasting life. 
So even though I didn't understand things totally or something didn't seem to totally make sense, I was like, listen, the organization knows what it's doing. It's guided by Jehovah's Holy Spirit. Jehovah got us. I'll just be patient and wait, right? Wait on Jehovah, as witnesses always say. So in 2015, there was an issue between my in-laws. My in-laws had a very tumultuous relationship. There was adultery. There was fighting. There was all kinds of stuff between them. My father-in-law is just not a really good dude. And so one day my wife calls me and she's like, listen, my mom said there's a really big emergency and we need to go to my parents' house right after I get off work. All right, no problem. We shoot over there. We're talking to my mother-in-law and she's like, listen, your father's been cheating again. And he had been uh, disfellowshipped previously for adultery and he had... Um, been reproved. He had gotten in trouble numerous times for infidelity. So I'm like, oh boy, this is bad. And my wife is like, oh no. And so my mother-in-law's showing all kinds of evidence that he cheated, receipts and, and pictures and all, all kinds of things. I'm like, oh boy. And um, later on, he admitted that he had cheated them. And, you know, my mother-in-law was furious and she had called the elders and told them about it. So naturally knowing a little bit of the process of how things work when someone commits a gross sin or a serious sin as Jehovah's Witnesses uh, prescribe it, I was like, all right, well, there's going to be a judicial committee. So a week goes by, two weeks go by, three weeks go by. And I'm asking my wife, hey, uh, any update with uh, what's going on with your parents? Because I'm figuring, hey, there should be some kind of judicial going on by now, right? I mean, the man admitted that he committed adultery. So what's going on? And nothing had happened. But again, I'm a loyal soldier for the organization. I'm a company man. I'm like, well, hey, listen, the elders know what they're doing. So more time passes. And my wife is like, um, nothing has happened with my father that's a problem and I'm like listen babe babe just wait on Jehovah the elders they, they they're in control they know what they're doing Jehovah's Holy Spirit is guiding them. you know just giving her all the company man lines all the standard Jehovah's Witness lines but in the back of my mind I'm also a little confused I'm like what's going on here because I thought we were supposed to keep the congregation morally clean this man admitted to committing adultery. So this doubt started growing larger and larger, and it got really huge one day when we're at our meeting. So we're all in the same congregation, and the brother who's the chairman for the meeting, uh, that weekend meeting, he calls up my father-in-law to open the meeting with prayer. Now, I remember so clearly, my wife is sitting inside the auditorium. I was on the outside of the auditorium because I was an attendant on the outside. And they call his name for opening prayer, and I like froze. And I'm like, wait, what? They called who? For what? I didn't pay attention at all during that prayer because I'm like, brothers, what is going on here? So after he prays, my wife storms out of the auditorium and she comes into the lobby and she's looking at me and just staring at me like, and I'm like, um, I, uh, I had no idea what to say because I had been giving her all of this nonsense about, hey, listen, wait on Jehovah, trust in the elders, and they're clearly getting something wrong. So long story short, there's a much larger story to this, but basically a couple of elders on the body had covered up what my father did, particularly one elder um, had literally, you know, evidence put in front of his face. My mother-in-law showed him things and he said, I don't want to see that and just dismiss my father-in-law's adultery. It wasn't until a year later when I became an elder and I uh, conferred with the circuit overseer on this and another family friend of my in-laws 
talked to our circuit overseer that uh, my father-in-law finally got a judicial committee and was eventually disfellowshipped. But I was like, this is ridiculous. It took a year and a half for someone to face a judicial committee for something that is clearly considered a gross sin by Jehovah's Witnesses. And I'm like, what happened to keeping the congregation clean? I thought the Holy Spirit was supposed to motivate elders and push elders to make them handle things properly. So clearly, that was a huge doubt for me. So that was the first of four really big doubts. The second big doubt also happened uh, initially in 2015. I was online and I was reading an article about uh, Jehovah's Witness conventions. This journalist decided to visit a Jehovah's Witness convention and, you know, he's just talking about the things he saw. And it was a pretty fair article in my opinion. I, I thought it was interesting. But you know how you go on a website and you read an article and you get to the bottom of a page and it gives you related articles. And I saw Jehovah's Witness child sex abuse scandal in Australia. And I was like, wait, huh? And to that point, I had never, ever heard of there being a child abuse scandal. I had heard of people being molested before. I had some close friends who had been molested in congregations, but I had never heard of there being a scandal. And that was when I heard about the Australian Royal Commission. And for those who don't know, uh, in this Australian Royal Commission, they were taking a look at child sexual abuse in religious institutions, and one of which was Jehovah's Witnesses. And long story short, there were over a thousand cases of child sexual abuse that were never reported to police. And it clearly showed that it was a systemic issue in Australia and later documents came out that it was a systemic issue all over the world in the Jehovah's Witness organization. But initially when I first read about it, um, the cognitive dissonance kicked in, the Jehovah's Witness mechanism kicked in and I'm like, ah, nah, 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 nah. that's not true. That's, that's opposer lies. That's, you know, apostate lies. They're just trying to make up things to, to say the organization is bad, right? Because that's the mechanism that kicks in. But really, I kept reading, I kept doing more studying on child abuse and the way that abuse victims react, and I was reading more about the commission, and I was like, okay, all right, maybe it's true, maybe it's true. But listen, the, the organization is taking care of these things, these elders are no longer going to serve. This is not a big deal. And then over time, I started reading more articles about issues with Jehovah's Witnesses and sex abuse. And I started reading uh, about some of the specific cases. And eventually, I had gotten to the point where I was like, all right, it is a systemic issue. But... Once I had started serving as an elder and I looked at the uh, directives when it came to handling child sexual abuse, I was so dedicated to the organization that I'm like, listen, all right, it has become a systemic issue, but good elders like me, we're going to pray for Jehovah's, Jehovah's Holy Spirit and we're going to make sure that this gets taken care of. We're not going to let children get molested on our watch. You know, I, I was so full of positivity and I was like listen we are not gonna let this happen and it got to the point that you know I felt like listen I'm gonna be on a watch for this I'm gonna make sure this never happens and I'm gonna talk to elders and other congregations and make sure they're handling it right I really thought I was gonna make a difference in that way you know I didn't realize that it was such a huge systemic issue that started from the top down that one elder or even a handful of good elders really couldn't make the difference. I didn't understand that at the time. And that drum started to beat even louder once in 2017. I had a daughter of my own, and I'm like, man, what would happen if someone molested my kid and an elder told me not to go to the police or an elder found out and they didn't call the police themselves? I mean, 
it, to me, it's just common sense, right? When a crime happens, you report it to the authorities. If someone breaks into your home, you don't call the local congregation, hey, what should I do about this? No, you call the police. So for me, it was like, well, why aren't we being told first to call the police? Why are we being told to call the branch office first when we know about child sexual abuse? It's, it's ridiculous. And eventually that became a huge doubt, one of the major reasons why I'm no longer a witness today. So then there was a third major doubt for me. And this was one that I had always had a doubt about, but the drums started to get louder and louder the longer that I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. That issue was of misogyny. Misogyny in the organization and misogyny in the Bible. Now, I was raised by a mother who was a feminist. She believed in equality of the sexes. She taught me about egalitarian relationships. And so as a child, for me, it was always first nature to treat everyone as equal. I had never had this idea of men being better than women or they should be treated better than women or, or men are smarter or anything like that. You know, I had always viewed everyone on the same plane. So when I learned about the Bible and the way Jehovah's Witness hierarchy worked and that there were no women in leadership, it was a little odd to me. But I was like, oh, listen, they seem to have everything else, right? Let me just follow God's direction. But over time, you know, I started to read certain scriptures in the Bible and they started to bother me more and more and more. And I tried to make excuses for them saying, well, listen, God has an arrangement. Let's just follow it. You know, he, he has this arrangement for a reason. But the reasoning stopped making sense to me. And I guess when it really hit the hardest was when my daughter was born. And I started to think, you know, she's going to have to face this open misogyny. She's going to have to face this really ridiculous submission simply because she has different genitalia. That doesn't really make sense. And over the years, I always noticed that, you know, they were really, really great, smart, competent sisters that, in my opinion, should have been serving in some higher capacity, you know. And it never really made sense to me that there were sisters who knew the Bible so well and were very well spoken, very eloquent, very intelligent, but they couldn't serve as teachers or elders in the congregation simply because their genitalia was different from mine. And I'm like, listen, if sister so-and-so knows the Bible better than me, She's smarter than me. She's better well. She's more well spoken than me. Why can't she serve as an elder? And eventually, I just stopped buying into this idea that men should be the head of women and women should be submissive. We're all human beings. I mean, biologically, there's not a huge ton of difference between men and women. Why shouldn't women be able to teach in the congregation? And it's not just a organizational issue. It's something in the Bible. And there are two particular scriptures that really woke me up and really made me just not have respect for the misogyny in the Bible. I'd like to read them for you. Got to throw on the glasses here. So one in particular is in... First Corinthians, and as you can see, got my gray sword, as the corny Jehovah's Witnesses used to call it. Um, First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 34. So it says, let the women keep silent in the congregations, for it is not permitted for them to speak. Rather, let them be in subjection as the law also says like wait what why do they have to be silent simply because they were born with different genitalia that doesn't make sense man because if we're really in a life-saving organization and we're supposed to be helping people learn the truth about god from the bible and learn the good news of god's kingdom 
If there is a woman who can explain a scripture to someone and help them learn better than I can, why shouldn't she take the lead? It doesn't make sense. And there's another scripture that particularly bothers me even more than this scripture. And I'm, I'm sure if you know the Bible pretty well, you know which scripture I'm going to. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11. It says, let a woman learn in silence with full submissiveness. So it's a little bit stronger than the scripture in 1 Corinthians. I'm just like, this is so disrespectful to women for no reason, you know? And especially growing up in a household with a mother who was very intelligent, you know, had a master's degree, one of the smartest people I've ever known. It's like, why wouldn't you want someone that smart to teach? It just doesn't make sense. And when you continue reading in the chapter and you read the context, you know, it's saying, for Adam was formed first in verse 13, uh, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Also, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was thoroughly deceived and became a transgressor. That's your reasoning for not letting women teach in the congregation? That's absolutely asinine, misogynist, sexist, and just plain foolish. And, you know, when I used to look at sisters in the congregation, like my wife, for example, who was very intelligent. My wife was born and raised a Jehovah's Witness, baptized when she was nine years old. She knew so much, and she was a great teacher and a great speaker, very good in the ministry. I'm like, she can't take the lead because of her genitalia? That doesn't make any sense at all. Why would a loving God not want his word to be preached by a particular person just because of their anatomy? doesn't seem to make sense to me. So that was the third of my four big doubts. Now let's get to doubt number four. And this was the one that really broke my faith, really stopped me from being a true believer. So as I mentioned, I was raised by a mother who was very intelligent. Uh, she was a teacher and she was a science teacher for most of my life. And I learned a lot about science throughout my life. One of the things I learned that archaeologists had found fossils and proof of uh, societies living long, long time ago. You know, I'm talking thousands of years before the Bible claims that Adam was created. You know, and I know that there have been fossils of uh, people found that are dated back millions of years. And... I mean, even the, the closest estimate, you know, the, the, the smallest estimate of how scientists view humanity, you know, we're talking 100,000, 200,000 years ago. So it just didn't make sense to me once I became one of Jehovah's Witnesses that the Bible said that humans had only been on Earth for about 6,000 years, but science is telling me that Humans have been on this earth for possibly millions of years, but at least 100,000 years. And there have been all kinds of findings of even proof of, of weapons made or, or writings or ancient societies and buildings going back at least, you know, we're talking 11,000 years ago. So how could the Bible say that humans have only been around for 6,000 years? And I knew because I was a good you know, Watchtower soldier, I had studied uh, very deeply that according to the Watchtower and Bible Tract Society, Adam was created in 426 BCE. And even if you disagree with that date or you say that ah, that's not an accurate date, the point is the Bible gives so many uh, deadline, I mean, um, uh, datelines and ages of people, particularly in Genesis, that you can count backwards and kind of figure out about how old the Bible says humanity is. The Bible is very clear about humanity only being about 6,000 years old. And so that was really confusing for me because I'm like, wait a minute, if humanity is only 6,000 years old, what about the scientific findings? And so the Watchtower's answers always like, ah, we don't trust carbon dating. We don't trust what those scientists say. They must be wrong because we know the Bible is true. 
And that's not really a, a good line of reasoning. That's that's really dogmatic and it, it gives no proof or no truth. And after all the years of research I did, I finally just had to come to accept that the Bible was wrong. Humanity had started a long, long time ago. And I started to say, well, okay, maybe Adam and Eve was just an allegory, or maybe it was just like a story that was to be metaphoric or represent humanity, but they give a specific age for Adam in the Bible. And from that point, once I had finally just accepted that, yeah, science was right, I lost all faith. But I was still serving as an elder at this time, and that made things difficult. On top of that, uh, and I, I mentioned I would get to this earlier, my mother had been studying with her two sisters, my aunts, and had been progressing to come into the congregation and to eventually become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And my mother studied for about three years and she was doing really well in her study. I'd even sat on her study and uh, conducted it one time. Uh, and I'm like, man, I now know that the things that I believed just aren't making sense anymore. They aren't true. What do I do? How do I tell my mom? But I ended up never telling my mom because my mom uh, was diagnosed with cancer in 2015, around the time when she started studying. And uh, that cancer was really tough really tough and by the time I had realized my doubts and I had realized that my doubts had become strong and I also realized that what I believed in was no longer the truth my mother was suffering greatly and her only hope her only uh, happiness really came from the fact that she felt that she was doing the right thing and studying the Bible and learning about Jehovah God and she had her family with her. She had me, she had my wife and my daughter, who she loved so dearly. And I just couldn't tell my mother about my doubts. I couldn't. Uh, I didn't want to break her heart. Uh, unfortunately, it's sad, but I knew that her time was short. I knew that she was going to die soon. And um, I, I would rather her go out with hope. Um, I don't look at it as, you know, I lied to my mother or anything like that because when someone has a little time left, I want them to enjoy it. You know, I want them to go out as peacefully as possible. So I just, I left those doubts alone and eventually my mother died in January 2019. Uh, she had progressed to the point of being an unbaptized publisher. Um, and it was tough because I knew that I didn't believe in what I was doing anymore. But I know that my mother died uh, with happiness, being around her family, surrounded with her family, doing what she thought was right, and she died with hope. And as much as I miss my mother, I miss her every single day. She died surrounded by family, surrounded with hope, and I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm glad that she died at peace. So, uh, that brings us to 2019. Now, as I mentioned, my, my mother passed away in January 2019, and I had been suffering uh, with the thoughts that I didn't believe in the organization for a few months then. I'd say, you know, six months, a little bit longer maybe. I had even given a talk on the uh, regional convention not truly believing uh, in the organization or in the Bible anymore, really. And I didn't know how to bring this out to my wife. I didn't know how to tell her. And I was stressed. I was really, really stressed. So I started asking my wife little questions and making certain conversation points to see how she felt 
about things. And I remember it was interesting. We were in North Carolina uh, visiting family a few days before my mom passed away. And I was in a store with my wife, and we were just talking. It was just me and her, and my mother-in-law was watching our daughter. So me and my wife were just, you know, just talking, spending time together. And I'm like, you know, I just don't understand why God makes people suffer. Now, we've both been Jehovah's Witnesses for a long time. I was, I was an elder and a regular pioneer. She was a regular pioneer. We know the Jehovah's Witness answer to why God allows suffering. But I wanted to see what she would respond with. And we had a little conversation. And basically, long story short, we both were kind of at the same point. We weren't fully believing in the story on why God lets people suffer. And it was from that point I realized that my wife had had some doubts as well. But I wasn't totally ready to tell her about my doubts yet. We just had little small conversations here and there where I would try and gauge where my wife's spirituality was at. Now, full disclosure... I am no longer a believer in anything religious or spiritual, really. I'm an atheist at this point. I don't believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And to be honest with you, even if it was, there's too much misogyny, sexism, uh, genocide, homophobia in the Bible for me to even care about that God. You know, if, if, if this is what God truly is, I don't think I want to be a friend of him his anyway and why does God have to be a he that's another story for another day anyway so the time goes on after my mother passed away I was you know really down in the dumps and I was just you know not doing well I was really suffering emotionally I was depressed and and also you know I had this weighing on my heart that I had been a dedicated Jehovah's Witness for so long and then I have all these doubts in my heart and and I know at this point that I'm not in the truth. So something really big happened. I'm at work one day, I'm, I'm on break, uh, I'm on Facebook, and I follow the Atlantic Magazine on Facebook, and I see this article, Jehovah's Witness, you know, sex abuse, scandal, and I'm like, oh no, not again, not again. But at this point, you know, I'm like, Listen, I don't believe this is the truth anyway. Let me read this article. So I read the article, and it's talking about the issues with uh, child sexual abuse. And I'm like, ah, yeah, I knew this. And, and it brings out about all of the uh, people that have never been reported to the police. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. But one of the things that the article touched on that I had thought about before but I hadn't given too much thought to was uh, the teaching about this generation, as mentioned in uh, the book of Matthew. So long story short, the Jehovah's Witness understanding is that when Jesus talked about this generation not passing away uh, before the end of this system of things, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that a certain generation of people will not pass away before Armageddon uh, comes and, and God takes care of all the wicked people on the earth and then his new system of things with a new paradise I, earth will come and because we're supposedly living in the last days this was supposed to come in our lifetime and the atlantic article interviewed a very interesting guy named mark o'donnell who mentioned that that was really like the breaking point for him that the generation teaching had changed so many times and when it had changed again he was like listen i'm done because the generation teaching had changed so many times because the leadership of jehovah's witnesses had created this time frame for the end to come the end didn't come so they said oh well clearly we must have misunderstood the generation teaching and they just push it a little bit forward and basically, if you watch the pattern, if you really go back and study the history back to the founder of the religion, Charles Taze Russell, this generation teaching has changed numerous times every time the time frame of the end of the world hasn't come. It just keeps getting pushed into the future. Common sense will tell you they don't have any understanding of what this generation meant in the book of Matthew. 
and the end's just not coming. So that really hit me hard. And I'm like, man. And I already knew I wasn't in the truth, but that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. And so once I read that article, I knew I had to explain to my wife that I no longer believed I was in the truth and I couldn't do it anymore. But I just wasn't ready to do it yet. Interestingly enough, I read the article on that Friday when it came out. She read it that Tuesday without any prompting from me. I didn't even tell her I read the article. She's like, did you see this article? I'm like, yeah, I saw it. And she was really upset about it. I'm like, wow. Okay, she's thinking a lot of the same things I'm thinking. But for whatever reason, I just still wasn't sure. I wasn't sure that she would be on board with me and, you know, feel like this wasn't totally the truth. And so I, I got really emotional about it. It really, you know, hurt me. And so one day I'm just sitting on the couch. My daughter is like just sitting in my lap and. You know, I just started breaking down in tears because as I mentioned, I had already been depressed. My mom had passed away. And I saw my mom suffer for so many months and years. And I'm worried about this fact that I'm not in the truth, right? Like this organization has been feeding me lies. And, you know, I don't believe in the Bible anymore. I don't believe in God anymore. And I'm just crying, you know, because it, it really hurt. And my wife comes in the door from work and she's like, whoa, whoa, what is going on? Are you okay? And I just tell her straight up, this isn't the truth. I don't believe this nonsense anymore. And I can prove that it's not the truth. And so we sit down and talk about it. And come to find out she had had a lot of doubts herself. Not necessarily all the same doubts that I had, but she didn't believe it was the truth either. And she didn't believe it was the truth way longer than I did. And I was like, wow, you know, it was kind of a relief because it's like, wow, at least I know that, you know, my wife is on board with me. She understands we see things from the same plane of view. So we had started talking and we're like, listen, you know, we got to get out of this. We got to we got to leave the organization. We got to figure out a way to, to get out. But we were well aware of how this association and this fellowshipping works. We didn't want to be shunned from our families. So we're like, all right, let's 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 try and fade out, right? So I had a plan. I was like, all right, I'm going to try and step down as an elder. And, you know, we're going to just slowly, you know, uh, slow down our, our ministry, which was already pretty slow because as parents and in the, in the wintertime climate of New York, you know, we weren't going out in the ministry anyway that much, especially now with our daughter. Um, and we were like, we're going to, you know, just, just slow down our, our service to the organization and try to fade out. And maybe by, you know, next year, by 2020, we'll just, you know, figure out a way to tell our families that we stopped. <laughs> then something really strange happened. So one day, uh, the coordinator of the congregation that I was in, mind you, I'm still serving as the service overseer, overseer, still handling all of my responsibilities, making lists for uh, local public witnessing, doing my parts of the meeting, not believing in it, but you know, just trying to keep up a front for a little bit. The coordinator tells me something strange. He says, you know, um, and he brings another elder. And he's like, listen, uh, you got accused of committing fornication wait, what? <laughs> like, that was literally my reaction. Like, I'm sorry, I got accused of what? So apparently, some sister in another congregation who was a little bit older than me uh, accused me of uh, committing fornication with her. Now, I'm a grown man. I'm married. Got a child. I know what sex is. I would know if I had it with someone. So I'm like, wait a minute. Are you serious? Now, you know, this is someone who, uh, you know, I didn't date in the past and I wasn't interested in dating in. And she might have had a vendetta. She might be suffering from some mental illness. Wh whatever the reason is, 
no one wants to be uh, uh, slandered. No one wants to have something said about them that they didn't do. So naturally, I was upset. But with this mindset of, you know, I already know I'm not in the truth, right? Hmm. How can I leverage this to get my way out of the organization? So I tell my wife about it, and obviously she's upset about it too. But we're both looking at it like, you know, this is silly, right? We know it's not true, but we also don't want to be in this organization. So I was like, you know, let's let's wait and see what happens. Let's see what happens with this uh, situation. And so, you know, I'm waiting on updates from the elders. And uh, in between time, my wife and I, at this point, because we had admitted to each other that we just didn't believe we were in the truth anymore, we had started opening ourselves up to doing real research on the organization. Uh, one thing, if you're not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, is that Jehovah's Witnesses are told not to do research on the organization if it didn't come from the organization's own words. So because of that, you know, as Jehovah's Witnesses, especially if you are raised in it as a child or if you were born in, you never do objective research on the organization because you're told everything from the outside is, you know, apostate lies, opposer lies, seeds of Satan. So we started doing real research and we started going on websites like JW Facts, JW Victims, uh, JW Survey. And we started watching videos on YouTube like, uh, you know, XJW Critical Thinker, Stop the Shunning, the John Cedars Channel, XJW Analyzer, uh, XJW Fifth. You know, we started opening up our minds and looking at different people's stories. We're like, wow, you know, we're not the only ones who feel this way. We're not the only ones who have seen odd things in the organization. We're not the only ones that can prove in numerous ways that this is not the truth. And then we just started expanding our minds and learning even more. You know, I had already knew that I wasn't in the truth, but then when I learned about the organization's relationship with the United Nations, that drove me nuts because I had this public talk, human rule weighed in the balance, and I've given it at least 50 to 60 times. And I had mentioned how the United Nations is the eighth king and the wild beast, and I'm like, how could the organization have a relationship with the United Nations of all people? That's ridiculous. So I, uh, you know, I learned about that. I learned about the fallacy of uh, 607 BCE and how no historian thinks <laughs> that's when, uh, when that uh, Jerusalem fell. I mean, I learned about so many things, uh, so many things that like it could be easily proven that what the watchtower says on the matter is just straight up wrong and as i mentioned you know i'm an atheist now i don't believe in god and i've always had a bit of a scientific background uh, because of my mother being a science teacher and then i started really analyzing the bible and just coming to terms with things that i had dismissed before the Bible doesn't make sense in a lot of uh, scientific ways, you know. The fact that uh, the Bible says that, you know, the sun was made on the fourth day, but there was already vegetation. You can't have vegetation without the sun. It's basic science. If you don't understand what photosynthesis is, I mean, it makes sense that men who wrote a Bronze Era book didn't understand basic photosynthesis when trying to explain creation, you know, or the fact that the first rainbow happened after the global flood. I mean, you're really trying to tell me that light couldn't reflect before the global flood? Okay, you know, and so just, you know, really opening our minds up and, and doing real research and not being afraid to look at the organization and the Bible with a critical eye we started getting very frustrated going to meetings. You know, it was difficult sitting at meetings knowing that we were being told inaccuracies and sometimes straight up lies. And so it got to the point that we were like, you know, 
we don't want to be here. We were at meetings, I mean, literally at times texting each other like, oh boy, this is nonsense. This is foolishness. And so we got to the point where like, you know what? We're tired of this organization. We want to leave, but we know it's going to be very difficult to fade out because I'm an elder and our, our we have family in the organization that is going to be very tight on us. We might just have to disassociate. And got this ridiculous claim on me that, you know, some sister said I committed fornication with her, which was spurious and it's slander. And I'm like, you know, that's even more evidence that God's Holy Spirit isn't active because if God's Holy Spirit was active and God really wanted to keep his congregations clean, you wouldn't have people just making straight up lies. And by the way, I got stories for days about people who have, you know, had privileges taken from them, people who have been disfellowshipped for things they didn't do, people who have been disfellowshipped for ridiculous things. Real quick, there was a brother that I served with uh, as an elder who was disfellowshipped uh, because someone uh, said that they had uh, that he had committed fornication with another sister, which was interesting because really all he did was give the sister a ride home because it was late at night. Now, he could prove that he didn't commit fornication but he still got disfellowshipped anyway. He stayed out of the organization for a very long time, but he decided to come back because, you know, he had a lot of family in the organization. And I understand that. The, the Thai family keeps a lot of people in the organization. But things like that, you know, it just showed that there was no Holy Spirit making these decisions. There was no Holy Spirit guiding people. I had done numerous uh, judicial committees as an elder. And... That was something, as I look back on, I'm like, you know, there was no Holy Spirit guiding me. I just made a, a educated decision based on the evidence and the information in front of me. So because of all of these things, you know, we're at a meeting. It's a midweek meeting. Uh, it was Tuesday, May 14th of this year. And, um, you know, we had just looked at each other and we're like, you know, we're both fed up. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm talking to the coordinator after he gets off stage. He was giving a part. And I'm like, uh, yeah, we're done. You know, th I mean, this, this, I mean, b beyond this silly situation, you know, there are just so many things that we just don't believe in anymore. We can prove, we can, you know, show that we're just being told nonsense and uh, we're done. So... He's like, whoa, I'm really sorry to hear that. And by the way, the coordinator of the congregation, really, really good dude. Like, genuinely good guy, you know. And then I hate, I hated to have to break his heart in that way. Um, but, you know, we just couldn't, we couldn't keep putting up a front. We couldn't keep doing it, going to the kingdom hall and pretending we, like we believed in this foolishness. So he's like, all right, well, um, would you like to write a letter? I'm like, nah, I don't respect the organization enough to write a disassociation letter. Well, he's like, all right, well, we need to hear it uh, from your wife as well, and we need another elder present. So I went to grab my wife. Um, someone was holding our daughter for us, and we told the elders, you know, and she told them from her perspective the things she didn't like, and I told them things I didn't like. And particularly in that meeting, one of the things that really pissed me off there was a video that was being shown about the relief work in the Caribbean. And they're like, oh, Jehovah Spirit guided this work. So Jehovah's Holy Spirit can work when it comes to building kingdom halls, brick and mortar. But when children are being molested by elders in the organization, Jehovah's Holy Spirit can't intervene then? Make that make sense. So, you know, we had just gotten tired of foolishness like that. And... We said, listen, that's it. We're done. We explained that to the coordinator and another elder. And that was the last meeting we went to. Never went back. So the next day, I wrote like a long four-page letter to my family explaining uh, why me and Janice were disassociating. And, um, you know, I gave them a few reasons. Uh, and I explained to them that I love them. And I'm not trying to isolate myself from them. But, of course, we know the rules about Jehovah's Witnesses and shunning, which is why I call them a cult, uh, along with the reason that you're not allowed to do outside research. Once someone decides to leave the religion, you are not allowed to talk to them at all. Total cutoff, doesn't matter if they're family, no one cares. 
And so I was shunned by my family immediately. Haven't heard from them except for one text. Um, uh, a cousin of mine, my older female cousin, she uh, texted me to basically tell me goodbye and that the world's going to be tough. It was really condescending because it's like, what would you know about the world? All you've been is a Jehovah's Witness since you were like two years old. But, I, you know, that's the witness way of showing love, I guess. Um, and it was really frustrating, you know being shunned it's it's still frustrating i i do have non-witness family so i have been reaching out to them but it, it it hurts it clearly hurts um but we also knew that was part of the deal you know and unfortunately that's what we had to do to gain freedom and uh we knew that was part of the situation so my wife has been shunned as well but uh you know we have a non-witness family we do have uh couple friends we've made in the world as witnesses as witnesses are referred to everyone who's not part of the witness world and uh recently we found out that a uh, friend of ours who had you know seemingly disappeared he had also woken up to the truth about the truth and left the organization so we've been reaching out to him and we're going to hang out with him with a little, uh in a little bit but um you know, that's what happened. That was that's my story. And uh, we were officially disassociated uh, that next week. Um, you know, it's it's been an interesting, an interesting few weeks, but I uh, can't feel freer, can't feel happier. Um, you know, life is going to be different, but it is also going to be better not living under mental tyranny, not uh, having to be continually lied to by an organization, not having my daughter, who you might be able to hear in the background, being raised uh, with lies and being raised with misogyny and ridiculousness. So, um, you know, I'm happy. Uh, my wife is happy as well. And uh, hopefully things change with our family. Uh, looking forward. It may not, unfortunately, but can always hope for the best. So that was my story. Um, this is just the first of many videos. I, I really want to get into doing videos and blogging. Um, I've been doing a lot of writing recently. Uh, I just want to, you know, share my story with the world. I know there are other people who have similar stories as I, so I'm going to be uh, opening up this channel to, to others. Uh, my wife is going to do some videos with me as well and I just really want to talk about issues that we face as uh, ex Jehovah's Witnesses the the shunning um, I want to talk about you know experiences we've all had I have so many stories I mean I was an elder for only three years but the amount of stories I have is ridiculous I, I didn't even get into the the big improprieties that happened on the el the first elder body I served on I could go for hours about that elder body but um, I'm gonna be doing a lot of videos and you know it's it's therapeutic of course but it's also uh, you know activist work because I want other people to know what happens in the Jehovah's Witness religion I want people to know what happens when you no longer believe I want people to know what happens when you leave and um, for other ex Jehovah's Witnesses uh, you know I want you all to, to reach out to me as well and let me know what you think I appreciate comments. I appreciate constructive criticism. Uh, hopefully in the future, my video editing gets a little bit better and I, and I get to, you know, uh, put my thoughts together a little bit better. I was just doing this off the cuff, but it's really, uh, it's really exciting to be getting into this activist work. I've already spoken to people on social media who have noticed that I'm an ex elder and I've been able to help a couple people find their way out of the organization and that really makes me happy because they no longer have to live under lies and tyranny and um this is a, a brand new world for me and my family but it's exciting so i look forward to talking to you all in the future and thank you uh for watching my video hopefully i didn't bore you too much hopefully if you're snoring i'm not gonna wake you up but uh i look forward to hearing from you all and uh I look forward to doing more videos in the future. Thank you for your time, and this is Matt, a.k.a. The Irregular Pioneer, signing off. See you soon. Be well, folks.